Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Church. I'd like to ask you if you would stand at this time. Well, it's Sunday morning, and we've gathered in the Lord's name. We're calling out to Him. We're asking Him to show us His power. Oh, Lord, show us your glory.
I love the Lord because he has heard my voice. He inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. Gracious is the Lord. O oh God, you are merciful. Beneath the cross of Jesus Christ, no shadow.
may be seated. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Calvary Church. My name is Bo, and I'm the senior pastor here, and I'm so, so thrilled that all of you are here and that we could come and that we could sing and that we could worship the Lord together. Every Sunday is somebody's first Sunday at Calvary Church, and that continues to be true. And I actually know for a fact that that's true here in the second service. I heard we have a bus of folks that came down from Canada. Now listen, now listen. <clears throat> you north of the border folks, we don't want to get that rowdy here at Calvary Church, so just going to need to calm down. No, I'm just kidding. You can be as rowdy as you want to be, particularly when I'm preaching this morning. So we'll, we'll get after it from God's Word. So... Um, we want to welcome you, welcome everybody here this morning, no matter where you might be, be, be from. My in-laws are actually here from Costa Rica, so we got people from north of the border, south of the border. We got it all covered uh, today, so, um, so we, are, uh, we are excited, and uh, we hope that you have been warmly greeted, but we would love, love, love to have an individual conversation with you, and we've created an environment where that can happen. It's called our welcome gathering. It takes place immediately after this service, the east end of the lobby. There's a room down there that says welcome gathering. I don't know if we can fit the whole busload in there, but we'll certainly give it a try. We would love to, to have you come. It's just a chance. We'll take no more than 10 minutes of your time. It's just a chance to, to tell you a little bit more about Calvary Church. Uh, it's a large church, so we'd love to have somebody to be able to, to shake your hand and to, to welcome you specifically. So uh, if that's true of you, if you're, if you're here, if you're looking for a new church, that's a great place to come to hear a little bit more about what's happening at Calvary Church. The other thing that's happening today right after this service is what we call Connect at Calvary. It's in the Overlook area right through the back doors, right at the back of our lobby. And, uh, and this is a great place to come if you need to be connected here at Calvary Church, you're looking for a Sunday school class or a small group or a place to serve. Um, last, week our last, yeah, last week, our ministry year kind of got started. Started. We had more kids uh, than, than we've ever had. We've got lots of stuff going on on Tuesday mornings, Wednesday nights, and, uh, and we are in need of more people to come and to serve and, and, and to, uh, to be a part of what we're doing. So I know some of you, you're just kind of getting around to figuring out your fall schedule, and if you've been saying, yeah, I've been meaning to get signed up for something, today's the day to go to Connect to Calvary and to get signed up for that. Uh, it is a busy day here at Calvary Church because tonight we have our what we call our annual congregational meeting. Six o'clock right here in this room. Uh, we do it once a year. Um, everybody is welcome. Um, this is, it's kind of a family meeting. It's a time for us as a church to, to, to come together. I've got the, the guide that we're going to give out to, to everybody tonight. Let me just highlight a few things that we'll be doing tonight. Uh, we'll be affirming our new elder and deacon uh, candidates tonight. We've got some ministry highlights and updates We'll spend a significant time talking about the finances of the church. We want to be, be open and let you know what's going on, and, and uh, we'll have a, a panel that'll be doing some discussion about, uh, about that. Uh, we will give out our order of the towel. Many of you that have been here, you're familiar with that uh, recognition that we do. Um, and the other thing that we do that's just a real, real sweet time in the life of the church, uh, and we have them all listed here, we, we've, we, we read the names of those that were a part of Calvary Church that passed away during this past year. And since last year's annual meeting, 51 people have, uh, have, have gone to be with the Lord. And it's just a sweet time to be able to remember those uh, as Dave Allen comes and reads those names. So um, about an hour, hour and 15 minutes, and, uh, and all are welcome. And we encourage you to come and, and be a part of what's happening tonight at Calvary Church. Now, I want to shift gears uh, just for a moment. And I want to keep talking about our values. Um, I know the kids are here with us. They're going to be dismissed in just a few minutes. Parents, don't send your kids yet. I actually want to pray for them this morning. Uh, so, so keep the kids there the next year for a few more minutes. Uh, but we've, over the last few weeks, I've taken about five minutes in each service, and we're talking about our five values uh, that, that kind of are foundational for what we do here at Calvary Church. Loving God, living God's Word, growing with God's people, going into God's world and investing in God's work. And today, I want to take just a few minutes and talk about going into God's world. This value of going has been there for the nearly 80 years that Calvary Church 
has existed. It's really been a part of who we are from the very beginning. The desire that we have to to take the gospel, to reach out to other people right here in, in our spheres and circles of influence, but certainly around the globe as well. So we describe this value this way. By extending the gospel to others right here, right where we live, right in our own circles of influence, but also around the globe. And particularly that idea of around the globe, it's been there from the beginning and continues to be a big part of who we are. We have over 100 uh, what we call global partners serving uh, all over the the world this morning, all over the world today. And uh, about a third of our overall budget goes to this value, goes to support what we're doing uh, worldwide. Um, And we want to make sure that we are a a church that's focused on the going aspect both here and around the globe because we think that it's biblical. Jesus said um, in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, I want you to make disciples of all nations. And one of the ways we do that is by going by going into God's world. So this value of going into God's world has been there from the beginning and continues to be a big part of, uh, of who we are and what we are doing. But I want us to, to think about something that for some of us might be a little bit of a new concept. For some, you're right there with it, you're tracking with it, but for some, uh, this might be a new concept. So let me introduce it this way. We believe that the church, the body of, uh, of believers, that the local church, is a gathering body. It's what we're doing right here this morning. We gather together. We gather to sing. We gather to welcome. We gather to greet. We gather to, to look at God's word together. And there's many things that we do as, as we gather together. And we would describe those things as things that take place at Calvary Church at 1051 Landis Valley Road. And there's many wonderful things that happen in this building. We come and we gather for worship services, for Sunday school class, for for small groups, for support groups, for big events, for concerts, for whatever it might be. Lots of things happen at Calvary Church because we're a gathering body. And we encourage you to invite other people to come and see. Say, hey, why don't you come with me to my Sunday school class? Or why don't you come with me to our Sunday morning worship service? Some of you are here today because somebody reached out and invited you and said, hey, why don't you come and see what's happening at Calvary Church? That's a big part of what we're doing. But some of us, we need to realize and begin to understand that it's not just about what happens at Calvary Church, but it's also what happens as Calvary Church. When you go on a short-term mission trip, when you gather in a home as your small group, you're doing that as Calvary Church. The, the, the body should also be a going body, not just a gathering body, but a going body. So we want to be able to gather, but we also want to be able to go. So the idea of inviting people to come and see, it's a great part of what we do, and we will continue to do many at Calvary Church events, but we also want to be a go and tell people as well. We want to be able to go and tell people about Jesus and about, about God and about what he's doing. We want to be able to go and serve our community and, and, and be a, a contributing part to what's happening right here in our community. So many of you are very w- aware that for the last 15 years, one of the big at Calvary Church events that we've done is something that we've called Harvest Fair. It grew from about 300 people when it started 15 years ago to over 6,000 people last year. It was a great at Calvary Church event. But as many of you have heard, we're going to take a break this year. We're not going to have Harvest Fair. And here's why. Part of the reason is we need to just reevaluate it. When you go from 300 to 6,000, you think we had traffic problems on Sunday mornings? You should have been here last year for Harvest Fair. We were not very good neighbors just because of the sheer numbers of people. So we need to reevaluate it. And as we're reevaluating, what we're going to do instead is have a greater emphasis on who we are as Calvary Church. So this fall, we are beginning an initiative called Community Impact. This is an opportunity that we have to equip the people of Calvary Church to have an impact in their most natural circles of influence. As you go to your schools, to your workplaces, to your neighborhoods, as you go and serve as a small group, we want to better equip the people of Calvary Church to be great servants in our community. Many of you are already doing it and doing a wonderful job. We want to be able to tell those stories, but we also want to be able to equip and to motivate others to do it. So we're going to do it in a couple different ways. One of the ways that we're going to do it is we're going to 
to provide opportunities for us to go and serve together. So here's an example that you're going to hear more details about in the coming weeks. The weekend of October 16, 17, and 18, Water Street Mission, downtown Lancaster, has asked us to come and to help flip 21 men's dormitories that just need a, a, a makeover. And so they're gonna need literally hundreds of volunteers from Calvary Church. We're gonna set up shifts and we're gonna go down there and we're gonna serve our community in that very tangible way. But the other thing that Community Impact uh, is going to do is this. We have created what we call a field guide. And we want you to pick one of these up today as you leave. They're available at the connection centers, either end of the lobby, or you can go to impactlancaster.com and download one so you can have an electronic version. This is something that's designed for you to work through as a family, as a small group, as an ABF, and it's a great guide to say, hey, how can we more naturally impact and serve the spheres of influence that God has brought into our lives? So we want you to pick Pick this up. We want you to work through this, and we'll be giving you more details about this uh, as we go through. Here's one thing I want to make sure that you, that you don't hear, because this is something that I'm not saying. I'm not saying we're never going to do Harvest Fair again. We just need to evaluate it. But we also need to be a church that's very focused not just on doing come and see events, but we need to be a church that's going and telling as well. And this fall, we're gonna have a greater emphasis on impacting our community and on going out and making a difference with the gospel of Jesus Christ right here in Lancaster. Lots more details to come. We're excited about some of these initiatives, so stay tuned for more information. Finally, one last thought with this value of going into God's world. Many of you have a great, great opportunity to do that because if maybe you're not, maybe you don't realize this, you know, yet, but school has begun. Some parents are rejoicing that school has begun, but many of you uh, that are involved in the local school system, you're back in school, school has begun, and it's a natural sphere of influence for you to have a great, great impact uh, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here's what we want to do as I lead us in prayer this morning. I just want to pray for you guys that are involved in the school system. I want to pray. I want to commission you. I want to kind of pray for you as, you as we begin another school year. So here's, I, I want to ask, and I'm hoping that more people are standing than sitting, because I want to ask anybody that's involved in the school system to stand. Students, no matter how young or old, college students, teachers, professors, administrators, bus drivers, janitors, you work in the cafeteria, um, classroom aides, homeschool parents, cyber school parents, whoever it might be. If you're a teacher in Canada and you're on the bus today, we want you to stand because we want you to pray for you. Back here in the choir and orchestra, if you're involved some way, somehow in the school system at any level, I want to ask you to stand right now and I'm going to pray. Kids, teachers, homeschool parents, whoever it might be, wonderful. Let's pray together. Father, sometimes we think in order to go that we have to travel around the globe. But many times you just want us to go around the corner. And all of these folks standing right now, what an incredible opportunity they have to impact their community at school. So we pray for opportunities for each of these to make a difference for you in their daily circle of influence, no matter what that might look like. And Father, we also recognize that you are the God of all wisdom. So I come to you now on behalf of those who have been called to impart wisdom to others, our teachers, our professors, our administrators, those that pour into the generation of tomorrow. Would you cause them to walk by your spirit so that the fruit of the spirit that is produced through their life will nurture others? Would you fill them with genuine love for each of their students? Give them true joy for the work to which you have called them. Grant them your peace when the pressures and stresses feel overwhelming. Give them patience as they respond to difficult situations. Fill them with kindness even when others are cruel. May their goodness be contagious to everyone. May their faithfulness to you be evident to all. Give them gentleness of speech that builds and edifies others. And would you grant them self-control even when their world is chaotic. And I thank you in advance 
for how you will continue to use each and every one of their gifts to impact, mold, shape, mentor, equip, and encourage the young minds and hearts that have been entrusted to them. And for each of these students, may you use their education this year to be a part of the molding process into the young men and women that you desire. May each one to be, continue to become more and more like Jesus. And may the impact that all of these that are standing be far beyond anything that we could ask or imagine or think. And may it be for your honor and for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Kids, you are dismissed now to King's Kids as our ushers come forward to receive our morning offering. in a sermon series called Grace Encounters. This is part five of a six-part series, so we'll finish this series up next week. And when we do, that doesn't mean that the grace ends. It only just begins. But if, uh, if God is working in your life in any way that he is working in mine, uh, it just seems to be because of preaching on this series, God has given me an incredible amount of opportunities to put this into practice. Um, so uh, it, it always seems to work that way. Uh, so I've been challenged to, uh, as I want all of us to do during this series, is to think about every encounter that we have to be a grace encounter. No matter how long, no matter how short, we want every contact that we have with somebody else to be marked by 
grace. So that's what we are talking about, and we're doing it by looking at John's gospel and seeing not every story, but some select stories to see the way that Jesus interacts and encounters others so that we can learn what it looks like to show grace the way that Jesus certainly does. As we said last week, we need people as gracious as Jesus to tell them the truth. Um, So that's what we're looking for as we go through this. So today, we are in John chapter 9. John chapter 9. So if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to open there with me. Uh, If you don't have a Bible, that's fine. I'm going to put lots of the verses up on the screen, but we'd love for you to open and have a Bible uh, open in front of you. You can find a Bible right there in front of you, and it's on page 895, uh, the Bible that's there in the pew back, um, so that you can follow along with this story. This is a long story, so I'm going to talk pretty quickly. We're going to move through this fairly quickly. Um, I want to tell you right up front, I think that this is a a humorous story. I think there's some humor involved in, uh, in what happens here in this story. I'm going to try to bring that out and point that out to you. Um, but uh, I, I've, I've read this story many times. I've taught this story uh, many times, but there's things just by looking at it through this lens of a grace encounter uh, that, that I've seen maybe for the first time. So let's, uh, let's dig into this together. John chapter 9, starting in verse 1, says this. As he, talking about Jesus, passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. So I didn't even make it past verse 1 when I looked at this and I said, okay, we're talking about every encounter being a grace encounter. And maybe Jesus didn't use those exact words, but I think Jesus was trying to teach his followers so that when they see people, that they would make every encounter a grace encounter. So I said, okay, I'm going to look at this passage through that lens. I'm going to look at this passage through that lens of saying, I want to see all the different people that interact with this man born blind and see how many of them are going to be as gracious as we know that Jesus will be. So it's interesting to see all the different people that encounter this guy and to see how many of them actually showed him and responded to him with grace. The first group of people that we see is the disciples. The first people that have an encounter, not necessarily with this guy, but about this guy, is the disciples. And you would think besides Jesus, if there was anybody that should have a grace encounter, it would be the disciples because they've seen Jesus do this over and over and over again. So let's see how the disciples respond when they see this man who was born blind. Verse 2. And his disciples ask him, Rabbi, how can we help this man? How can we serve this man? How can we show this man grace? Is that what they said to Jesus? That's what they should have said to Jesus. In order to make it a grace encounter, they should have viewed him as somebody that has a story whose story matters to God, therefore it should have mattered to them. And they should say, hey, how can we serve this guy? That's not how they viewed him at all. They said to Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned? Was it this man or his parents that he was born blind? We're not interested in helping him. We're not interested in serving him. We're not interested to see if there's anything that you can do for him. We have our category of knowing why people suffer And he must be suffering because somebody sinned. Tell us, Jesus, who was it? Was it him or was it his parents? We're really interested to know. And maybe the follow-up question would have been, what sin did they commit? How grievous of a sin was it that somebody would be born blind? They're not interested in this guy. They're interested in having a theological conversation about him. He was a category to them. He was a stereotype to them but not to Jesus. What does Jesus say? It was not that this man sinned or his parents. He said, you need to think differently. You have preconceived understandings of the way that God works, and I want to blow that out of the water. And he says this. He says, but that the works of God might be on display in him. They said, you're viewing him as a category. 
You're viewing him as a stereotype. And the way that you need to view this guy as somebody who has the potential for God to be at work in his life. And that's how you and I need to view everybody that we encounter. And that's how you need to view yourself. Because as we said last week, some of you are so self-condemning. And you don't see the potential that you have of the work that God wants to do even in your life. And sometimes when we encounter other people, we encounter them as a problem. We encounter them as a category. We encounter them as a stereotype instead of saying, you know what? This is a person that's made in the image of God. And God wants to put his works on display in their life. Now, we could really wrestle with what's going on theologically here. Was this guy born blind and spent all of these years blind just for this very moment? That'd be an interesting thing to wrestle back and forth on and talk about God's sovereignty and how all that works and whatever. But is it possible that there's something that's going on in your life? That God wants to use that to put his works on display? And maybe that right time hasn't come just yet for that to happen. For some of you, if you could just walk away from today's message with this one single idea that we could view people as having the potential for God's work to be put on display in their lives, to me, that would be the biggest application you could take away. If that's a new idea for you, or if you say, you know what? There's something that God's doing in my heart about that because, yeah, I kind of view people as, as people say, you know, what can I benefit from that person? Or that person's just a category, or that person's just a stereotype to me. Instead of viewing every single person that you see as someone that has the potential for God to be at work in their life, it could be that that's the only thing that you take away from today's message. You don't even have to listen to anything else I say if that's something that struck you. Just write it down and head on out and beat the traffic. I wouldn't even be offended if that's the most important thing for you to take away from today's message. But it's a pretty good story, so you might want to stick around and hear what happens next. Verse four. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Verse five. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world, said Jesus. A few chapters later, the disciples come to Jesus, Philip particularly, and he says, can you show us the Father? Can you show us what God is really like? You know what Jesus says back to him? He says, Philip, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. That's one of the things that Jesus did when he came to earth. He was the light of the world. He put God on display for all to see. The disciples had preconceived notions about the way that the world worked. Who sinned, they said. This man or his parents. They had preconceived ideas about the way that the world worked. Jesus came to deal with those preconceptions. He came to shine light into a dark world and to show us what God is like, to show us what his character is like to show us how to be rightly related to him. That's what Jesus did as the light of the world. Verse six, having said these things, he spit on the ground and he made mud with the saliva. Now, don't skip over that. We know that Jesus does a lot of things really well. That's a lot of saliva that he must have spit on the ground in order to make enough mud to put on this guy's eyes. So don't miss that. That's an application from today. When you leave here, just go and try it. <laughs> See if, you're even, if it's even possible for you to get a big enough loogie going on. I'm, hey, we're all thinking it. We're all thinking it. I just want to be real with what the text is saying. Jesus spit on the ground and he made mud. Go try that. See if you can do that. Jesus does everything really, really well. It's amazing. He spit on the ground and he made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud. And he said to him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. 
So he went and he washed and he came back seen. One of the things that you need to, just so you can follow and, and track along the rest of the way, this guy at this moment, I believe, never saw Jesus because Jesus didn't heal him right there so that Jesus could see him immediately afterwards. He made the mud, he put it on his eyes, sent him away to wash, and it was only after he washed that the miracle took place and he came back seen. And when he came back, Jesus wasn't there anymore. So this guy never saw Jesus at this moment in the story. That's important as we continue to work our way down through it. So the guy gets healed physically and continues to have encounters. And I just want to tease this out a little bit and say he started with an encounter with the disciples that was not very gracious. Let's see if his encounters become more gracious or if the encounters with him become more gracious as we work through this. So next in verse 8, he has an encounter with his neighbors, with the townspeople that were all around. Verse 8 says this. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar. Why is that important? Because it tells us how those people viewed this guy. Just like the disciples had done, they made categories. They didn't see him as a person. They saw him as a beggar. They saw him as another mouth to feed in this town. So now they're going to have an encounter with this guy. Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it's he. Others said, no, but he's like him. So do you see what's going on? The people gather as this guy comes back and he's able to see. And some people are saying, hey, that's the beggar. He used to be blind, but now he can see. No, that's not him. It's just... And the guy's standing there in the middle saying, I am the man. It is me. I'm the one that used to be blind, but now I can see. Imagine this scene. Imagine what's going on. When he says that, I am the man, you know what I wished would have taken place? What I wish would have taken place is that somebody would have celebrated. It's really you. You can now see. That's fantastic. Let's have a party. Is that what happened? That's what grace would have done. Verse 10, so they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? We're not interested in celebrating with you. We're not interested in making a cake and having a party. We want to know how this happened. How did this take place? Verse 11, he answered, the man called Jesus, even though he didn't see Jesus, must have known who he was. The man called Jesus made some mud, which again is pretty impressive with the saliva thing, in case you missed that part, and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. Okay, now, now the people are going to celebrate. Now they're going to have a party. Now they've gotten the explanation that they need. Now they realize that this is a person who God's works have been on display in his life. Now they're going to celebrate with him. Is that what happened? Verse 12. They said to him, well, where is he? Where's Jesus? No cake, no streamers, no popper things that you, you know, pull on, on New Year's Eve. Where is he? And he responds and he says, I don't know. He sent me away to wash. I came back and he's gone. I can't answer your question. I don't know where he is. But can somebody at least just give me a high five, something. This guy can now see people and animals and trees and God's creation for the very first time and nobody's excited for him. Nobody's excited that God did a work in his life because they don't understand how he did it and they're more concerned with getting their questions answered than with celebrating with this guy. So now he has another encounter. He has an encounter with the Pharisees. Maybe the Pharisees will celebrate with him. Verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. I'm sorry, this is the way that I read scripture. You just have to ask this question. Did the guy go willingly? Again, he's looking for a celebration. He's looking for a party. 
and they're dragging him to the Pharisees. He wants to go and see all the things that he's never been able to see before. And they're still, you know, he's a little project to them because they don't understand how it worked. They need to get their answers. So they bring him to the religious leaders. They bring him to the sacred men and say, maybe these guys can give us an answer of what's going on. Verse 14. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud. Okay. Now we understand what's going on. It was a Sabbath day. And these guys are non-mowers on Sunday type people. (laughs) Jesus made some mud on the Sabbath. And according to their rules, that was a no-no. That was a no-no. He shouldn't have done that. So now we have the real issue. Jesus did something that didn't fit into their categories. It didn't fit into the way that they think that things should have been done. So again, they're not interested in celebrating that this guy can now see. They're not interested in celebrating the fact that this guy can now contribute to what's going going on in society. This didn't happen the way that they thought it should happen. This didn't happen according to their system and according to their rules, and they've got everything controlled. So now they've got an issue with it. Verse 16. Some of the Pharisees said, after the guy said, he put mud on my eyes and I wash and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man's not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. Again, we know how God works. We understand the way that God does things. And this doesn't fit into our category. This doesn't fit into our box. So this isn't, he didn't do it the right way. But there was division. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such things? End of verse 16. And there was a division among them. So they're conflicted about what's happening and what's going on. Again, I don't think anybody's showing grace to this guy. Nobody's celebrating with this guy. This is out of their paradigm, out of their, out of their box of the way things that work and the way that God works. Verse 17. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? And the man responds, he's a prophet. Now, here's what we don't get. This is where I just just would have loved to have been there. What was the tone of voice when when the man who was formerly blind said, he's a prophet? Was it with boldness? Well, he's a prophet. Or was it almost inquisitive, like, he's a prophet? I don't know. I don't know what the tone of voice would have been. But as he's hearing these guys wrestle through this, he's now maybe making some progression in his understanding and saying, how could this guy have done this if he's not from God, if he's not a prophet? So the Pharisees, they're not celebrating, but they certainly can't get their answer. So they need to keep churning this over and they need to keep trying to figure out what's going on. So now they bring in the guy's parents. Let's see what his parents have to say about this. You would think if there was anybody that the guy could have a grace encounter with, it would certainly be his parents. One would think. Let's see what happens. Verse 18. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and ask them, verse 19, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see Verse 20, his parents answered, we know this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he'll speak for himself. Do you see how the parents even distance themselves from what's going on? Here's what we know. He is our son He used to not be able to see. Now he can see. We're just excited that this guy can move out of the house and finally get a job. (laughs) But they can't answer the questions and they back away from the Pharisees. Do you know why? Because the Pharisees were sacred men who not only controlled the religious life, but they controlled everything that was going on in that whole community. Look what it says in verse 22. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. 
For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. That wouldn't just affect their religious and their spiritual life, but that would affect their lives socially and economically. And they said, whoa, 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 we can't deal with that. We can't explain how our son now sees, but we got to be really careful what we say about this Jesus fella because these guys that have control over everything, they're going to kick us out if we say the wrong thing. Verse 23, Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. That's why they said that. So now what happens in the story is we see these guys, the Pharisees, go back to him a second time. So now we're going to have a second encounter. Maybe, let's give the Pharisees the benefit of the doubt. Maybe after talking to the parents and hearing that it really is him and now he can really see, maybe now's the time to get the poppers out and get the cake out and really have a celebration. Is that what's going to happen here on take two with the Pharisees? Let's see. Verse 24. For a second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man, talking about Jesus, is a sinner. That's what they said to him. Verse 25. He answered, Whether he is a sinner... I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. I want to pause here for a moment. I want us to interact with this verse just for a minute and see what's going on here. The first thing the man says is this. Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. There is an aspect that what we see in this man throughout the passage is putting his humility on display. When there's something that he doesn't know the answer to, he's willing to say, I don't know. I don't know how to answer your question. I'm not sure of the right response. On the opposite end, what we see in the Pharisees is the opposite taking place. We see their pride growing and growing and growing. And when they don't have answers to their questions, they ask more people. Or they respond very negatively and, and, and insulting other people. Because it doesn't fit their categories. So they're really going, you know, in opposite directions. But here's what the man who had been born blind is really saying. He's saying, there are some questions that you are asking me that are just unexplainable, and I don't know the answer. But I'm humble enough to just say, I don't know. But even though there are some things that are unexplainable, there are other things that are undeniable. And that's what his focus is on. See the first part? Whether he is a sinner I don't know. It's unexplainable to me. I don't have an answer for that. But you know what the second part is? The second part is undeniable. Here's the one thing I do know. That though I was blind, now I see. His focus is not on the unexplainable. His focus is on the undeniable. And he says, I can speak about that. Does that happen to you sometimes? That sometimes you miss the things that's happening in your life or you miss what's God, you miss the undeniable things that God is doing because we're so focused on the unexplainable. We're so focused on the things that we don't have answers to. And, and what I'm not saying, I'm not saying that we shouldn't seek out answers. But we're not going to get every single one of our questions answered. And we've got to determine which are the ones that are really important that I need to get answers to, and which are the ones that it's okay to not have an answer to, I can still believe, even if I don't have that answer. He didn't allow the unexplainable to get in the way of the undeniable. But that certainly wasn't the case for the Pharisees. Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, I was blind, now I see. The exchange continues. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Verse 27, now 
This guy's starting to get a little ornery. I kind of like it. Verse 27. I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Wow. As a zinger, huh? He's gotten pretty bold in what he's saying. I'm sure he said it with grace. I mean, he said it with a whole lot of grace. It's very much a grace encounter. But oh, what did that do to their pride? That was a direct shot. So you know what they did? They reviled him. They insulted him because he challenged them. He challenged their system. He challenged what they believed. You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses in their best Charlton Heston voice. We are disciples of Moses. And he goes through this passage and they say this. We know that God has spoken to Moses, verse 29. But as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. Verse 30, the man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And here's what they did. In their pride, not out of any sense of humility, not out of any sense of conviction, not out of any sense of, we were wrong. In their pride, they said to him, you were born in utter sin. We don't view you as somebody whose God's works could be done in their life. We can't explain what happened. This doesn't fit into our categories. So we're done with you. We don't care if you were blind and you can now see. You were born in utter sin. And would you teach us? Would you try to teach these sacred men that have all the sacred answers? And they cast him out. You look at that and you say, it's unbelievable. How can that happen? How can these guys that have, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt, in a sense, such good intentions about helping people find their way to God. But their lack of humility and their pride just wells up and they just do so much damage in the lives of individuals, they cast this guy out. It's unbelievable to me. Oh, but as any good story does, it ends with a Jesus encounter. He already had an encounter with Jesus, but remember, he hasn't seen Jesus yet. He knew that Jesus is the one that healed him, but he hasn't seen him yet. Now, you talk about grace. Look at this. This might be a nugget that you need today. And again, maybe you'll leave before the message is over and this is all that you need to hear today. Look what it says at the beginning of verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out and having found him. Just stop reading right there. That's grace. This guy's hurting Damage had been done to this guy by sacred religious people. And what does grace do? What does Jesus do? He goes and he finds him. Grace doesn't wait for hurting people to come to us. Grace goes and finds them. And grace goes and finds hurting and suffering people and say, you know what? Other people may have given up on you, but I know that God's works can be on display in your life. And God wants to use you and me to bring that life-changing, healing message of the gospel into people's lives. Grace seeks out those that are hurting. Amen. And that's what Jesus did. And he comes to him and he says this, Do you believe in the Son of Man? We don't have time to unpack what the Son of Man term means, but the Jews understood this as, this is a messianic title, right from Daniel chapter 7. Jesus is not just saying, do you believe that I'm a human being? 
Jesus saying, do you believe in the Messiah? Do you believe that God is sending Messiah, the exalted one from Daniel chapter seven? Do you believe that Messiah is coming? Verse 36, and he answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? The blind man is essentially saying, I do believe in Messiah. I do believe that the Christ is coming. Tell me who he is because I want to believe. Jesus said to him, verse 37, you have seen him. You've seen him with your eyes that were closed for your entire life that have now been physically open, now you see him. You see Messiah. You see the Christ. You see the Son of Man. And it is he who is speaking to you. Now, if this guy, the man who had been born blind, if he was like the Pharisees, or if he was like the neighbors, or if he was like the disciples, or maybe even if he was like me or you, after Jesus said this, do you know what he might have done? He said, oh, that's well and good. But there's a whole lot of things that are unexplainable to me. How did you get so much saliva to make that mud? I just can't, it just baffles me. Can you answer that question for me first? And you did it on a Sabbath. Is that legal? Are you allowed to do that on a Sabbath? Can you give me the answer to that? Oh, and Jesus, you know, I've got some other ones. I just need to know if, if Adam and Eve really had a belly button or not. I just need to know <laughs> if that happened. Jesus, before I do anything else, can you just tell me how many angels can truly dance on the head of a pin? Can you just answer that for me? My point is this. Sometimes we feel we have to get all of our questions answered. Sometimes I feel like we have to know everything that's unexplainable before we can believe in the undeniable. Is that what this guy did? Man, look at the next verse. It's just beautiful. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. It's enough for me. And I believe, and I'm going to worship you. There are some of you this morning that your doubts are getting in the way of your belief. And what I'm not saying, please don't anybody hear me saying that we shouldn't seek questions, shouldn't seek answers for our questions. It's why we do a class at Calvary Church like Foundations, because we want you to know the reliability of the Bible. We want you to know and be sure uh, that, that the foundation of our faith is that Jesus died and rose again and that was an actual historical event that happened. We want you to have those answers. But sometimes our belief is like we're an airplane and we're coming in for a landing and we're ready to touch down and we're ready to be like this guy and say, I believe. And right before we hit the ground, oh, another question comes up. And we, you know, go back up and we circle around again. And for some of you, your belief, it's in a holding pattern. You know, you're circling around the outer marker and you're not willing to land the plane because you say there's just too many things that are unexplainable. And I want you to continue on that journey and I want you to continue to find those answers, but there's got to be a point even with the things in your life that are unexplainable, that you come to the place that you say, what do I believe about Jesus? Is he the Messiah? Is he the son of God? Did he come to earth to die on the cross for my sins? And did he raise from the dead? And if he did, then I can believe and I can worship, even if all my questions aren't answered. Because my focus is gonna be on the undeniable, not on the unexplainable. From here, Jesus goes on and he says this in verse 39. For judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see. Not physically, but spiritually. And who are those that don't see 
that he brings sight to them. Those that don't see are the ones that recognize that they have a need that recognize in their humility that they can't earn and work their way back to God. Jesus comes and reveals and brings light to those folks that are humble enough to receive it and to understand how to be rightly related to God. But those that think they see, those that think they have all the answers, those that think their system is going to provide all the answers to all the religious questions. Those are the ones that Jesus says are truly blind because they're not humble enough to admit their need. Do you see the progression in this story of the blind man? Do you see his progression of humility? He starts in verse 11 and he calls Jesus the man. This man called Jesus made saliva and put mud. But his progression continues in verse 17. And he said, he's a prophet. And because of his humility, his faith is growing. And it comes to the end and Jesus is able to say to him, do you believe in the son of man? Not that he's just a human being, not that he's just a prophet, but do you believe that he's the promised Messiah? And the guy's response is simply this, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. For some of you, you need to take that step today. You need to take that step of faith today to be able to say, I believe, all my questions aren't answered, but I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and he died for my sins. You put your faith and trust in him for the very first time. For many of you, for most of you, I believe that God wants to do an amazing thing in your life That God's works want to be on display in your life just as they were in the life of the blind man. And that he wants to do that in all the people that you encounter. And we need to start viewing people that way. That God's works can be done in their lives. But there are some of you that you're not living to that full potential of what God wants to do in your life because those doubts keep coming in. And those doubts keep creeping in. And sometimes the doubts come in when God doesn't act the way that you want him to act. When things just don't seem to make sense of what's going on in your life. Sometimes, you know, when I doubt, I doubt when God doesn't act the way that I would act if I were God. Well, if I was God, I would do it this way. And when he doesn't, it leads to doubt. Because we just can't see and we can't explain it all. So for some of you, your step of faith today is to continue to seek out the answers to the questions that you need, but don't let that get in the way. Don't let that get in the way of what's undeniably that God is doing in your life so that the works of God might be on display in you, so that his grace might come to you and then his grace can flow through you so you can have grace encounters with others. I'm going to invite John and some of the other members of the worship team to come back, and we're getting near the end of this series, and how can you preach a series on grace without singing that great hymn, Amazing Grace? And for many of you, for some of you, spiritually you were once blind, but now you see because of God's grace. So I'm going to invite us to stand. Let's sing this together, and I'm going to come back and pray for us.
Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your grace that's put on display to us through the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, through his life and ministry and miracles, but his death on the cross for our sin, his resurrection, which affirms who he truly is and what he has done for us. May the grace that we receive with him, from him, then flow into the lives of others. Father, may we view ourselves and everyone that we meet as someone for whom your works can be put on display in their lives. May we see everyone that way so that every encounter is truly a grace encounter for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. As you go out the doors today, reminder of the welcome gathering, the east end of the lobby, connect at Calvary in the Overlook area, six o'clock tonight for the annual meeting. We'll see you next week for the final installment of Grace Encounters. Have a great day.